السلام علیکم یو واچنگ نیوز اینڈ آئی ایم فیصل رحمان لائیو فرام اسلام آباد اسٹوڈیوز کپل آف ویری انٹرسٹنگ ڈیولپمنٹس ریگارڈنگ افغانستان ون از اباؤٹ دی پریزنس دیٹ وی آلویز یوز ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ اباؤٹ دی نان اسٹیٹ ایکٹر سچ ایز پیپل فرام آئی ایس آئی ول ناٹ یوز دس ورڈ آئی ایس کے بیکاز وین ایور وی ٹاک اباؤٹ دی نیریٹوز دے آر آلویز سیٹ بائی دی ویسٹرن ورلڈ ویدر یو ٹاک اباؤٹ دس وار آن ٹیرر اور یو ٹاک اباؤٹ ویپنس آف میس ڈسٹرکشن and now we are hearing about this isk now what exactly is that supposed to mean if you remember the former president of afghanistan mr hamid karzai mentioned about the mystery helicopters who were those people who were being brought in uh, by uh, some forces i would say who had control in afghanistan and obviously i'm talking about united states of america and they were bringing in those um, uh, hardliners i would say those extremist elements into Afghanistan all the way from Syria and Iraq and that was the time when the Russians had exerted their pressure in that region and finally what we have witnessed that the Russians they have left Syria things are getting pretty much better out there but when you talk about this region obviously they did not walk all the way via Iran into this region because for them uh, Iran is an adversary having said that how many people are there uh, who is financing them who is supporting them who is equipping them with latest uh, uh, sort of uh, all the weaponry i would say at the end of the day there is somebody looking after those affairs because those people are not pashtun majority these are the people from various central asian countries and perhaps mostly from syria and iraq now they are here for a certain job they have been assigned a certain task to destabilize the region and obviously when we talk about uh, the afghan people or the afghan pashtun element or let me be very straight the taliban for that matter they do not have any design beyond the borders of afghanistan but when we talk about is obviously they have a different ball game altogether and that is perhaps the major threat uh, posed to all the regional countries whether it's russia whether it's the central asian states or it's iran pakistan or even china so that is in fact uh, the problem out there latest development was um, on last friday when there was this bombing that killed 100 innocent people in a mosque mostly shias in kunduz what was that supposed to be that was a message that instability is the mission of these non state actors you talk about the bombing at the kabul airport killing almost 200 people including 13 us personnel and what all happened we all witnessed that perhaps this has to come to an end and i believe and most of these analysts believe that the taliban if their government is supported if there is proper legitimacy out there things are sorted out financial issues are taken care of is k perhaps has no future in the region because the taliban are strong enough to look after their internal issues but where will it lead there are so many questions uh, but before i uh, introduce you to our panelists or we start having a proper conversation regarding this topic our production team has prepared a package let's watch it the military presence of united states within afghanistan proved to be unsuccessful in terms of establishing positive traditional as well as non traditional security The proof of this failure is the ramping up terrorist activities of the Islamic State in Khorasan province since the United States left Afghanistan in the hands of the Taliban. Hence the Afghan citizens are still walking on the two-faced sword of economic crisis as well as the terrorism. Undoubtedly Pakistan, China and Russia as the regional stakeholders are consistently trying to engage Afghanistan as productive regional and international political entity but the terroristic infiltration and presence in Afghanistan are blocking all the efforts of these regional stakeholders. The world powers apprehensive of the situation are also trying to find the safest way to avoid the humanitarian crisis and accidental terror funding at the same time. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov speaking at the 17th meeting of heads of security agencies and intelligence services of Commonwealth of Independent States stressed the need to block supply chains of military products to terrorists in Afghanistan. He also underscored the need of preventing the looming humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. He said that the Commonwealth of Independent States, Collective Security Treaty Organization and Shanghai Cooperation Organization must synchronize their efforts to prevent Afghanistan from becoming the haven of the terrorists again. 
where the world powers are stuck at the procedure of finding the safest way of aiding Afghanistan, the regional cooperation and alliances should move one step forward to create a joint force to cater to the terrorist entities in Afghanistan and making it tread on the way of economic prosperity. Now to talk about this very important issue, let me introduce you to our panelists. We have with us in our studio, on my right is Brigadier Retired Asif Harun Saab. He's a senior analyst. Sir, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. And we also have with us Dr. Kandil Abbas, <coughs> expert in foreign affairs and international relations. Thank you very much, Kandil Saab, for your thank time. You. And we will also be uh, talking to uh, Mr. Andrei Kortunov. He is going to join us from uh, Russia, Moscow, and he is the uh, Director of Russian International Affairs Council. Uh, he's going to join us in a little while. But let me start off from you, Brigadier Saab. Uh, obviously, there is a lot uh, that has been said in the report. But now, my very straightforward question is that when we talk about ISK, uh, this uh, presence, we have no idea what exact number is, but perhaps it is around six to 10,000. That is what is generally believed. Now, sir, all these people, in fact, uh, never existed here before. This is a new phenomena but uh, a very prominent one. And if you look at uh, the strength they have, the way they carry out bombings or the way they have attacked the Taliban or the innocent people who were worshipping in the mosque perhaps, or all those who wanted to flee out of um, Afghanistan, they were targeted as well. Now my point is, sir, how big this threat is, not only for the Afghan people or for the Taliban regime, but perhaps for country like Pakistan and Iran. So let's start off from there. Right. Uh, before we come on to your question direct, uh, regarding ISK in Afghanistan, I think it would be worthwhile to just go over what was IS to begin with. Now, what I have gathered and what I have researched, and I have given very long presentations and written a lot about it, that it was created in 2006 in Baghdad in the Bakan camp uh, run by the CIA. And at that time, the head of this organization was Zarkavi. So the main objective of that IS, which was called ISI, that is Islamic State of Iraq, was to fight against Al-Qaeda, which by that time had become very strong and they had almost uh, taken over the Western Iraq. So the first starting of the... So primarily IS was created to counter Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Al-Qaeda was an adversary of the United States of America. United States of America and they had failed to you know defeat them the battle of Fallujah and Ambala and all uh, uh, Ambar in those areas. Mm -hmm. Then the next step was when this uh, Zarqawi died and Baghdadi took over mm. this uh, uh, outfit was then shifted uh, via Jordan, there it was trained by the French commandos and the Israeli commandos and inducted into Syria to fight the uh, government forces of Assad al Bashar al Assad. Bashar al -Assad. And there so then. Initially, sir, they were also called, I remember when, when the French used to talk about that we will support the rebels. They were known as rebels initially. Yes. And those rebels eventually were not the real rebels. Right. They were created by CIA, by the French and by the yes. Israeli authorities. They were trained, financed, and they were sent for, for a particular reason, yeah. correct? Because, you know, in the war in Syria, there the distinction between mm. the, the good rebels and the bad rebels had also emerged mm. that uh, this is acceptable and that is not acceptable. But out of all the uh, militant groups that were fighting against the Bashar al-Assad forces, this emerged as the strongest force and it uh, managed to capture whole of eastern um, Syria. And then by January 2014, it managed to hop in back into Iraq and then started capturing major cities like uh, Fallujah and uh, another uh, station where they managed to uh, defeat a core size force and from that victory this IS, IS which was then named as ISIS and someone called it ISI Levent. So uh, that became the strongest and the richest uh, uh, militant outfit in the world. They uh, had got gold. Gold. They took over I remember two billion dollars yes. from a bank 2 .3 also. Yes. 2.3 billion, yes. 2.3 billion, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So, and then they uh, created a state called Islamic State, which stretched from Raqqa in Syria up to Dalia in Iraq mm -hmm. under Baghdadi. And um, he claimed that he is now the descendant of the Prophet and he is the rightful Caliph. And that then carried on and then you, if you remember that uh, the Americans jumped in with their Air Force and they started bombing them from August 2014. But nothing much came out of it because they were their proxies. Uh, they, you know, they are on record. And the Americans were not bombing where they were supposed to bomb. Yes, they were bombing <laughs> the right, wrong places, in, in fact. And there were a lot of videos which saw the droppings of supplies given to the ISIS. This also and then happened in, in, in uh, Afghanistan also, sir? In, oh, yes, of course. And then, you know, all their patients used to be treated in uh, Tel Aviv. So that was all there. Now you mentioned about their, uh, uh, you know, shifting into Afghanistan. That happened in 2015. Mm -hmm. And that was the time when, you know, this uh, Mullah Umar death had uh, was been enough. revealed mm -hmm. and Mullah Mansoor had taken over. And this uh, revolution was made with a purpose to divide Afghanistan and some division did take place because the son of Mullah Umar and Mullah Yaqub, his uh, brother, they, uh, you know, fell apart and they made their own group. So that did happen. Now this uh, Karzai, what he mentioned at that time, that he he, know, he knew that helicopters were flying in, that was a fact. Because this Ajit Dawal, he was constantly in touch with the ISIS in Syria. And they were supplying them the explosives and the weapons in the, in the battle of, of Syria. And that had become their major source of supply. So basing on those contacts, the CIA and the RAW, they both organized their shifting in helicopters and they brought them to a place called Nangarhar. Now Nangarhar was the place where a splinter group of the TTP under Khalid. Khalid Khurasani. He, you know, this Khurasani start, you know, we, uh, everyone, every leader of the TTP started calling him. This Khalid Khurasani was from the moment chapter, if I'm not wrong. Yes. Sir. Exactly, mm -hmm. from Mohammed. Even Fazlullah, he added mm -hmm. Khorasani to his name. So th they were married up in uh, uh, Nangarhar and a very strong base was established and they then started carrying out. The dual purpose was one to fight the Taliban and another to carry out terrorism in Pakistan. So that is their history of coming in. Now the nucleus was brought from Syria and Iraq, as you, as you mm -hmm. said. But then the bulk came from within Afghanistan, the, which included Afghanist, uh, Afghan Taliban also, but mostly from TTP and other militant organizations. So these were the splinter groups that joined hands with the IS. You see, there were uh, 50 groups under TTP in that's North Afghanistan. All had been pushed back into Afghanistan, and they were living on those uh, sanctuaries provided mm -hmm. by the NDS and RAW and the uh, Afghan. Well, that's regime. a very good detailed, uh, uh, you know, concept. I think most of our viewers understand what exactly this is supposed to mean. But sir, uh, talking about um, the same uh, group, we learned that people from UK, from Europe, like places like Germany, for that matter. And you know, it was an advertisement uh, in the, uh, in, uh, you know, on the internet yes, in course. various, um, you know, forms and uh, eventually so many people joined hands with them. Whatever happened, sir, the way they, uh, in fact, killed the Yazidis, the way they treated them, uh, whatever happened to their women, I mean, I'm talking about villages and villages and villages and thousands and thousands of people who were killed, literally like, dub, you know, they, one is holding a Klashenkov, people are coming in, they're just firing in, the, in their heads. And thousands of people were killed in a matter of hours and days. Now, sir, when we talk about Afghanistan, obviously, whenever a, you talk to any sane person with even this much of an IQ, sir, he would say that, you know, obviously, if they are here, there are certain forces which do not want peace to prevail in Afghanistan, number one. They want the situation to remain fluid because at the end of the day, if the Americans had spent 2.2, 2.3 trillion dollars and yeah. they were there for a reason. So if they have withdrawn their forces, doesn't mean that we should consider that uh, as a war lost by the Americans. Because at the end of, of the day, the aim was never to eliminate Al-Qaeda. 
they really wanted their presence to be felt in the region. For 20 years, they had put a check to the Chinese, to the Russians, to Iran, perhaps Pakistan yes, as a yes, nuclear state. Of course, of course. Now, sir, if the Americans have left at the end, of, but they still have their proxies there. And those proxies are more dangerous in the absence of the Americans physically on ground. How bigger that threat is, sir, especially for a country like Pakistan, who has very efficiently fought this war on terror. We have been able to flush out those non-state actors and those miscreants. And now the threat is there again. And the threat is ballooning. Faisal, you have very rightly highlighted that uh, uh, United State, uh, States has, uh, in fact, uh, initiated this game in the region and on even global level. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to add uh, another thing. Brigadier Saab, uh, Saab has highlighted that uh, IS was created to counter Al-Qaeda. But before that, if we want to explore uh, the origins of terrorism and origins of uh, use of uh, religious extremism in the region, as uh, Hillary Clinton has mentioned in his uh, book and is in his uh, repeated uh, statements that uh, they were trying to counter Soviet Union in Afghanistan, but their even commanders were not able to fight on the mountains of Afghanistan. So they started to uh, recruit, recruit. religiously, they started to reclu recruit uh, Arab youth and from South Asia, from Central Asia and on the name of jihad they started terrorism in fact because before this period we even don't have use of this terminology of terrorism in uh, political literature Absolutely. Uh, so after that uh, when they recruited these people from different regions to confront with soviet union they confronted and they provided them facilities they provided them training and uh, weapons but when after soviet collapse we have a, a very uh, dramatic change in American policy. They left them on the ground and they went back from this region. And that created Al-Qaeda in the region, in fact, because they were already trained, they had weapons, and they were uh, grouped in this region. So they created their own groups. So they started, in fact, uh, moving towards uh, another issue that is very political issue because uh, during Cold War, the issue was uh, political and a strategic issue. But after Cold War, after Soviet collapse, United States started to promote its unipolarity in the world. And for this purpose, they uh, tried to involve in different regional con mm -hmm. conflicts and those people and those youth uh, uh, groups who were uh, legitimately demanding for resolution of Palestine issue, Kashmir issue, and uh, a situation in Iraq and Afghanistan, they started to confront with the conspiracies of United States and other powers in these conflict uh, uh, regions. So that has in fact created the terminology of terrorism and terrorist groups in this region. And uh, particularly, uh, ISK, when we are talking about this, it is a, a regional affiliate of IS, and uh, they were recruited from South Asia and Central Asia for to support IS in uh, Syria and Iraq. So when they were defeated by Iraqi Popular Mobilization Front, uh, they came back and they were sent back to their own region and they established their splinter groups in uh, 2014. But officially they organized themselves under ISK in January 2015. Mm -hmm. And their present number is I think uh, announced number is 3000 fighters because before that they were more than 6000 fighters but under uh, several uh, Afghan government's attacks and Pakistani government's operations, a uh, lot of their fighters were killed. But now their strategy is uh, targeting soft targets. And when they are targeting schools, colleges, universities, hospitals, even uh, general public, it is showing that they are being used to create once again instability in Afghanistan and uh, consequently in uh, common border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. That is the whole scenario. Now one quick comment sir and that is about since you talked about uh, the soft targets. So what exactly do they have in their mind? What's their agenda? Because when you talk about Khorasan, I mean 
the general idea when Baghdadi took over was that you know they want to expand uh, into various Islamic countries and they want to have their presence and eventually it is going to be one huge Khilafat kind of a, of a setup. But sir, when you talk about Afghanistan in particular, the kind of resistance the Taliban have shown or their allies have shown, sir. Now, you cannot differentiate uh, that uh, one uh, person is a th member of the Taliban for that matter and the other one is from the Khorasan. They look the same, they are holding the same weapon, they are speaking the same language if they are local uh, people. Do you think, sir, if situation gets worse in Afghanistan and the issue of refugees that is something which we are really concerned of. For example, if that happens and you end up having a million people in Pakistan inside, wherever you want to keep them, but you know, obviously you can't uh, make sure that they cannot be diffused into the main system. What if a certain number gets diffused into the main Pakistani system and eventually this is what the Indians would like to have and that is going to pose a much bigger threat to a country like Pakistan because at the end of the day, uh, making Pakistan or converting Pakistan into a destabilized country is the agenda and then you know uh, commenting about a nuclear system and all. So perhaps that is the larger game. Uh, Faisal I think in post Cold War era three major threats were created and the main threat was uh, religious extremism mm -hmm. but along with that uh, the nationalist perspective was created, nationalism and ethno-nationalist separatist movements. These were three main perspectives. Okay. So the uh, religious terrorism and religious extremism was uh, workable in South Asia, particularly in the country like Afghanistan and even Pakistan. So uh, India and American uh, intelligence forces started to utilize these uh, sentiments against regional uh, powers, particularly China and even Pakistan. So for mm -hmm. this purpose, I believe that when uh, we are talking about what is in their mind, I, I, I believe they don't have anything in their mind. They are being dictated by their masters. What they are being dictated, they are doing that because they don't have their own planning. When, once they are targeting... They are the puppets exactly, and the puppeteers exactly, are sitting somewhere exactly. else. At this so, uh, so if you allow me now, we've also been joined in by Mr. Andrei uh, Kotunov, uh, who is uh, the director of uh, Russian International Affairs Council. Uh, Mr. Andre, thank you so much for your time, sir. Welcome. Pleasure to have you in the show. Since we are talking about the presence of uh, ISK, in particular in, in Afghanistan now, sir, Obviously, that is posing a huge threat to countries like Pakistan, Iran, I would say China, and last but not the least is Russia. Because when you talk about the softer belly of Russia, sir, these are all Muslim states. And Vladimir Putin, the president, m has made sure that nothing of that sort, uh, you know, uh, should be there in the region because that is the real threat to destabilize any country. But, sir, at the end of the day, what we have learned, the Western countries like United States of America, CIA in particular, RAW from India and a couple of other hostile uh, intelligence agencies uh, like uh, uh, Mossad from Israel. They are supporting them, financing them, handling them, assigning them with various targets. So primarily what I've understood is that there are certain uh, countries, they have their own proxies in the region and they want this region to be, to remain destabilized or perhaps to get from worst to worst. Uh, your take, Mr. Andre. Well, I agree with you that uh, there were many cases uh, when uh, large powers uh, uh, tried uh, to manipulate uh, these uh, international terrorist networks, uh, but they always failed uh, in trying to do that uh, because uh, usually it turned out to be uh, the other way around. Uh, terrorist networks uh, were much uh, uh, better equipped to manipulate uh, uh, their sponsors and uh, their donors. Uh, if we are talking about uh, ISIS uh, Khorasan, ISIS K uh, in Afghanistan, I think the good news is that uh, here we can probably rely on assistance uh, from Taliban because uh, <laughs> Taliban in the end of the day no, yes, uh, is a movement of uh, Pashtun nationalists. They are not particularly yep. interested in exporting uh, their model to neighboring countries. However, 
ISIS, ISIS K is a movement of uh, Islamist internationalists, and uh, they represent the main danger for neighboring states. So here I am uh, somewhat optimistic about working together with Taliban. All right. Now, do you believe that uh, the current situation in which the Taliban regime is, I mean, nobody is recognizing them at the moment. There is no financial assistance for the people of Afghanistan. There is no moral there is no political and there is no diplomatic support uh, over there, sir, for, for, for them primarily. And this can lead to an absolute chaos. Is that what the Americans and the West is waiting for, sir? Well, I wouldn't exclude that uh, because, uh, of course, uh, a chaos in Afghanistan uh, would overshadow uh, the U.S. defeat in Afghanistan. And uh, the public attention uh, will uh, move away uh, from what uh, Americans did there uh, to how Taliban failed in Afghanistan. Uh, however, I don't think that uh, we are already uh, witnessing this situation. I think it is a little bit premature to say that Taliban has failed and that the situation in Afghanistan is getting close to a humanitarian catastrophe. I think that the situation is very complicated there are serious problems, uh, uh, but I don't think it's not manageable. Now, another uh, quick comment before I come back to the guest in the studio. You think, sir, the presence of IS in the region and the assistance they're getting from countries like India or United States of America, and especially uh, after the pact, the defense pact between the Indians and the Americans, and then whether you talk about Bika or otherwise, and this strategic kind of a partnership, you think that is actually posing a threat uh, to the regional countries, countries like Russia, China, Pakistan, and, uh, for example? Well, uh, the terrorist uh, threat uh, uh, which might be in Afghanistan is definitely a, a challenge uh, to neighboring countries. Uh, and uh, I think that all of them uh, should be united uh, in their attempts to confront this threat. But I would... Uh, say more. I think uh, it should be in interest of countries like India uh, to join this coalition, maybe within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, because India has nothing to gain uh, if uh, international terrorism spreads in Afghanistan. All right. India. Do you think India should be engaged? India is not a neighbor. India, India has always uh, been India a, a country from which has the played the most outset. negative role didn't have any business to step into Afghanistan. It doesn't share border with Afghanistan. It has no religious cultural affinities with Afghanistan. It is a detached neighbor. We know there are six neighbors around Afghanistan which form the inner circle of Afghanistan. And interestingly, when the United States came in, now the big question which comes to one mind is that after all, why the United States picked up Afghanistan as the number one target? Why didn't it first go to Iraq, which was its main objective, you know, to change the boundaries of the Middle East and capture their oil and for greater Israel and all that and all that. The main reason of selecting uh, uh, this place was that Islamic ra radicalism after the Afghan jihad and all in which, you know, uh, the jihadis from uh, 40 Muslim states had been collected together by the CIA and all that. Mm -hmm. They had, you know, waged the war and they were all there because no country had accepted them back into their country. So they were, were very much here. So this was one reason. And the other reason was that this was to be turned into a military station where from it could have a, a monitor closely China, which was its main ad adversary, the resurging Russia, then Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan being nuclear, Iran uh, an old antagonist, and then Im uh, critically important Middle East. So from this place, you know, he, uh, the United States could easily manage the future geopolitics and also the mineral resources, over $1 trillion uh, of mineral resources, particularly the lithium. So this was the main reason that it came. But interestingly, pa Pakistan having been made an ally, a coalition partner, a non-NATO ally, yet it was not put into the core grouping in Kabul, and uh, India was put into that core team. 
in Kabul and it was stationed there and it was then given the main task of destabilizing and denuclearizing Pakistan and that is how India figured in. So you think that Indo-Pak concept was in fact converted into AFPAC? Of course. By, by a certain uh, but design. <laughs> design, yeah. Yes, and mm -hmm. then because when uh, Obama came, then he spelt out the AFPAC, you know, policy. And what was that AFPAC policy? AFPAC policy was what he was. Forget about Durand Line. We will come in, barge into FATA uh, and these um, areas whenever we get the actionable intelligence and carry out. It was General Kiani who put his foot down that no, we will, uh, you know, follow the anvil and uh, hammer strategy that when we are chasing them, you provide the anvil and we anvil and mm -hmm. from, from there when it comes, we will do that. But we did it and they didn't do it as was seen in 2009. Now the second question which comes is that why after all this uh, 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 in Afghanistan, w how the unraveling started from uh, what point? Was it now that uh, Biden came? Because the whole blame is you know, put on Biden that he's responsible for this, all this. Did he create the mess? It was during Obama time when it was found out that they'll not be able to win this war. It was in 2009 that two troops Sir, but surges. This gentleman, who happens to be the 46th US president, his name is Mr. Biden, he was the vice president with the same gentleman, Barack Obama, not once, rather twice. I agree. Don't you think that he knew what was going on? Uh, yes, he, he was, was knowing, but president? then he was against his uh, troop surges and this continuation. Because, you know, Obama in 2011 had spelt out the drawdown strategy and policy. By I December remember they wanted to, uh, you know, withdraw their forces by 2014. December. Remember, sir? Yes. And it was going on very steadily. 140,000 1, troops was reduced to just 12,000. But then at the last minute, the Pentagon once again prevailed that, you know, you must leave behind a resolute support uh, mission there because the Afghan national security forces are still not very stable and strong to, you know, be able to confront the Taliban independently or, or singly. Therefore, they should stay on. And that is how they stayed on. And then when Trump came, he further increased the level from 12,000 to 20,000. But after one year, then he also came back to the same thing of the thing. But the interesting thing is that Pakistan has been helping the United States at every stage. Without Pakistan help and cooperation, the United States could not have, uh, you know, occupied Afghanistan so easily. It would have been a very tough and expensive battle. Secondly, it could never have fought the 20-year war at its own if Pakistan had not provided the two logistic supply routes. And thirdly, when the, why uh, 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 Trump went in for the Doha? Because a stage had come that a stalemate had been created and they knew that they neither could defeat them nor they could contain the Taliban, nor they could stay there peacefully, nor they could exit peacefully. They had, they had no plan, in fact. They had no plan, in fact. Even and now they have no plan. And then for <laughs> Doha, Pakistan mm -hmm. again helped the United States. And for their final exit, again Pakistan helped, helped the United States. But look, even today, you know, even Henry Kissinger mentioned uh, the role of India in Afghanistan and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the former Secretary uh, defense of the uh, yeah, United States and even General M.C. Crystal, they had always been talking of the negative role of the, the India. It was a, it, India is the biggest spoiler of game. It is anti-peace. It suits India. Whenever you talk to any Indian analysts, uh, Kandil Saab, they would, you know, always make sure that uh, the situation out there should remain fluid because that is what suits them. Now, interesting part is, sir, Talking about Pakistan and USA relationship, because at the end of the day, uh, we were the non-NATO ally, the frontline warrior, and so we paid the price. We paid the price. Exactly. Exactly. Imagine if 80 to 90,000 people were killed in the United States of America. How would they react to it? 13 soldiers died because of all their own stupidity, and they created a scene. 13. Total number was around 2,500, right, yes, sir? Uh, we are talking about 80,000. 80, God knows what's the number of people who lost their limbs and who were injured.
Of course. Forget about the economic losses. The mindset was changed, sir. And especially, now let me go back 10 years into the history, sir. Let's talk about year 2011. That was the time when Pakistan People's Party was in government. General Kiani was the chief of army staff. Sir, a couple of very important incidents. Salala, 27 exactly. of the soldiers were killed. Exactly. That wasn't a friendly fire. You talk about what Raymond Davis did and Mr. Sir. John Kerry had to come back and then eventually whatever happened, we are all aware of that. May the 2nd, 2011, that was a very important day and that has really triggered uh, so much when uh, according to the Americans, they had killed Osama bin Laden. God knows whether he was present there or not. Whatever happened with the consent or without the consent, that is again another chapter. There was yeah. this commission made. Again, Mr. Javed Iqbal was the person in charge. We do not know what was exactly the content of that. But what we realized that perhaps if he was there and then there was this retired ISI military officer and we all know what happened, how much money was paid and eventually he's having a ball of a time in. Uh, San Diego. Now that's a beautiful house where he lives and he just vanished overnight. So that means that Memo there was also. something. So I, I, maybe <laughs> perhaps I can talk more about it after okay. the program. Right. Okay. But sir, when, when you look at all these realities, what do you make out of it? First of all, uh, you rightly highlighted different incidents that... Uh, different place. incidents in one year? Yeah, yeah. It took place in this region. But please consider that uh, United States has uh, invested and spent billions of dollars in this region and they had certain uh, strategic goals and objectives in this region. And similarly, India openly has uh, invested more than three billion dollars in Afghanistan and uh, they had their own certain uh, strategic objectives and those, those three were billion were just for the optics, sir, oh, the actual uh, yeah, money course, that spent much more than the this. intelligence side in making sure that Pakistan should be, should be <laughs> much more than this. Of. They so, wanted us to bleed. So now both United States and uh, India are worried about, on the one hand, their billions of dollars in Afghanistan, and on the other hand, their proxies in Afghanistan. So uh, they will not leave the Afghanistan and this region uh, very in, uh, easily because they have their uh, still they have their ob strategic objective in this region and they want to uh, counter ch uh, Chinese uh, influence in the region and that is based on not uh, geopolitical that is based on geoeconomic activities and they have started lot of economic activities in this region that is the f first one is the most important one is uh, CPEC that is the flagship project of uh, Obor and uh, Pakistan is started to move towards economic development. That is not acceptable both for United States and uh, India. On the other hand, if you uh, uh, remember that in previous scenario, only three countries accepted th recognized Taliban, Pakistan, UAE Saudi, and Arabia, Saudi Arabia and UAE. But this time they also have learned a lot from their experience and even regional countries. And this time almost all the countries of this region, particularly neighbors of Afghanistan on the same page and they are uh, on the same page to support Taliban for establishment of their government. But the groups like ISK are not agree with Afghan Taliban because uh, they followed uh, negotiated peaceful settlement in Afghanistan and groups like brutal groups like ISK are not uh, ready to uh, um, support such uh, activities. So these groups can be misused by India and uh, United States in uh, both in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Pakistan successfully removed uh, signs of terrorism from Pakistan through uh, Zerbeaz and a uh, lot of other uh, minor operations. But this time, it is a, a challenge for United Nations especially that they should come up to play their effective role 
particularly they have uh, their own uh, counter terrorism policy they should not base their policies on united states or other big powers they must uh, play their actual role that can be uh, uh, utilized Kareem for saab, morality good governance sweet friends i mean these are the concepts which do not exist in today's politics and, sure, and uh, sure, foreign, sure. uh, foreign relations sir if you allow me because since I was told that I'm running out of time, I'll just go to uh, Mr. Andre and let me put a very straightforward question to him. Mr. Andre, now uh, looking at the current situation, sir, if the help doesn't arrive, winter has already arrived in Afghanistan, sir. Lack of food, lack of clean drinking water, medical facilities, uh, people running out, which we call brain drain. Recently, there was this report that um, Pakistan has cancelled or rather PIA has cancelled its flights to Afghanistan. The reason was that uh, 176 passengers were uh, offloaded because uh, they never wanted them to leave Afghanistan. They were trying to flee. And secondly, one of the senior most uh, PIA official was held hostage at a gunpoint. This is what uh, CNN has reported. Now, my point is, sir, do you think the Taliban can be blackmailed on the issue of financial assistance by the CIA or RAW for that matter. Forget RAW, sir. CIA is handling or the American government is handling them. And in such a case scenario, do you think the loyalties could be changed and instead of being friends uh, or uh, some sort of a government which we expect should be friendly with Pakistan on a West can become a hostile one and eventually could lead to some sort of a trouble, sir. Well, I think that unfortunately uh, it is a real uh, possibility that uh, some Western countries will try to blackmail uh, the new regime in Kabul and that we will see more sanctions uh, against not only Taliban but against uh, uh, Afghanistan at large, uh, including uh, a freeze of uh, funds uh, that are supposed to be released by international development organizations like uh, EBRD or the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and definitely that means uh, that the situation in Afghanistan is likely to get worse before it gets any better. However, I should say that uh, the Afghan society is a very resilient society. I think that uh, uh, they will survive. Uh, I don't believe in a humanitarian catastrophe in Afghanistan. Uh, I think that uh, for the urban population, uh, the uh, uh, the challenge will be very significant uh, because they will have to lead, to change their lifestyles in a very significant way, and uh, of course it would become even more difficult uh, to retain professionals. Uh, but uh, if uh, a Taliban uh, is uh, to go down the drain, uh, which is possible, uh, the odds are that it will be replaced by uh, a much more radical and much more uh, anti-Western uh, organization like ICK, and that would create even more problems for the West. So I can only hope that uh, this uh, opportunity of blackmailing a Taliban will be avoided. So last one minute comment. Do you think ISK being, because 9-11 to me um, is, is still something, you know, uh, that can be talked about. Happened, how it happened, who did it? Who was behind it? What was the purpose? And what was the ultimate goal uh, for the next millennium? Question now is, sir, do you think that uh, this current state uh, where Afghanistan seems to be in, in, in dire states at the moment, if this continues, this is going to be a bigger threat rather than uh, somebody else supporting the non-state actors such as ISK? Well, uh, I think that uh, the worst case scenario is that uh, we have a combination of negative factors. We have Afghanistan as a failed state, and it's also a hub for various international terrorists uh, that uh, could operate in the region, but also outside of the region. And I agree with you. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, even exclude uh, another 9-11. Uh, maybe not of this scale, maybe not necessarily in New York, in some other place, but this is a very real danger. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Andrei Kurtunov.
uh, for your uh, comments. It was a pleasure having you, Mr. Kandil. Thank you so much, Brigadier Saab, for your presence. And uh, that's all we have for this up. I'll see you, inshallah, tomorrow at 8.05. Till then, you take good care. Khuda Hafiz.